My name is Jeffrey Engel, and I have the great honor of directing the SMU Center for Presidential History. And it's a great honor and privilege indeed because we get to do events such as tonight, where we bring in some of the best minds in the entire country, the people who study, think about, and ponder the most important office, the most powerful office in the entire world, the presidency of the United States. And tonight, in fact, we'll be hearing from one of the foremost experts and historians in the country, Professor Melvin Leffler from the University of Virginia, who, of course, will be discussing the various and sundry memoirs produced today by the Bush administration. And, uh, the, and this is, of course, a topic that's important to us here at SMU, home, of course, to the soon-to-be-opened uh, Bush Presidential Library and Center. Now, the library, I think, will provide an unrivaled resource to our campus. And it's also a particularly valuable partner for us here at the Center for Presidential History. The lecture this evening is, of course, part of a broader series and a broader partnership between ourselves and the Bush Library. And to Alan Lowe and his staff, our continued and ongoing thanks for all the support and help in this project. And in fact, we relish the prospect of working more and more closely together in the future. Now, I realize that you all came here tonight to hear about the Bush administration and memoirs, but as I look at you tonight, I realize that you're also a captive audience. So let me take a brief moment, if I may, to fill you in on some of the latest developments at the Center for Presidential History. This is, of course, our second major event, our first occurring last November. And in the months to come, we will again... Oh, I'm sorry. In the months to come, we will partner again with the Bush Library on another uh, event, th that being Amity Schley's coming to discuss President Calvin Coolidge. And we're also doing a cooperative program uh, f focusing on the legacy and memory of President John F. Kennedy with the Sixth Floor Museum and the Tower Center, and that will be held uh, on January, excuse me, February 19th, in honor, of course, for President's Day. Now, in the months since we last gathered in this hall for a lecture on the presidency, we've also at the center enjoyed a series of firsts. We've awarded our first postdoctoral fellowship in presidential history. We've also developed our first research symposium, which is an exploration of Franklin Delano Roosevelt's Four Freedoms. You'll recall those, of course, to be freedom, let me see if I get this right, freedom from want, freedom from fear, freedom of speech, and freedom of religion. And this November, scholars from around the world will gather here at SMU to explore how Roosevelt's ideas shaped American notions of freedom over the ensuing 60-odd years since he was uttered, and also, I think, equally as importantly, how those notions of freedom were understood around the world perhaps in, synchrony, in synchronicity with the United States and oftentimes in divergence from the United States. It's at once national history and international history, and I'm very pleased to announce tonight that Oxford University Press will actually be publishing the volume from that conference. So look for it mid-November, mark your calendars, and since Oxford is gonna be publishing the book, let me remind you, the book will be out in 2014, and it's never too early to buy Christmas presents, so please you know, keep that in mind. Now we've had other firsts, We've named our first Presidential History Fellow, Dr. William Stedding, uh, give a big wave if you would, uh, who plays a critical role in our developing oral history program. And in fact, we've rebaptized that program as part of the Collective Memory Project. And I think this title more accurately describes not only the dynamic and synthetic way in which we aim to document the memories of the Bush years, both from individuals within and outside the administration, but also the cutting edge, wage, uh, cutting edge ways in which we intend to employ new technologies, new methodologies, and new approaches, because our aim is actually nothing less than to develop the best memory project in the world befitting this great university. And last but not least, there is one more first I'd like to mention. Uh, we also welcomed last year a new member to the Presidential History Center family, uh, Corin Franklin was born late last year to our associate director, Brian, and his wife, Janelle. She did all the work. Uh, and in fact, we are very excited to have Corn around, and we look forward to welcoming him to the SMU class of 2035. <laughs> so, which I, when I did the calculation on that, I couldn't quite believe it, 2035, okay. 
So having brought you up to speed with all the good news and firsts here at our center, let me turn to the best news of all, which is, of course, the talk tonight from Professor Melvin Leffler. He is a distinguished professor at the University of Virginia, having also served as dean of the College and Graduate School of Arts and Sciences at that school. And in fact, when I was asked by our own Dean Sutsui to describe Professor Leffler, I described him as the single best diplomatic historian in the entire country. I then suggested that we should test this theory by getting all the possible diplomatic historians who are in the running for that title of best in the country and put them in a steel cage and really let them go at each other. But Dean Susui would not let me run that experiment. He, he said something about IRB. Uh, and then consequently, uh, you're just gonna have to take my word for it. Uh, and now Professor Leffler is a graduate of Cornell University and he is the author of and, or editor of eight books. But just to say, give you that number, it does not actually do justice to the way those books have transformed the field. And let me offer, in fact, one visual example. I had planned to bring my own dog-eared copy, but it has actually been used so often, I think it's just about fallen apart. This tome in particular, uh, tome is the only word, really, uh, A Preponderance of Power, uh, National Security, the Truman Administration, and the Cold War, uh, helped establish Melvin as one of the truly great historians in the country because it combines a real uh, astounding degree of archival work with a brilliant synthesis. And in fact, this book garnered the Bancroft, Hoover, and Farrell Prizes, which of course you're all familiar as the triple crown for American historians, being respectively given to the best book published in any one year in American history, modern history, and U.S. foreign affairs. Uh, and I bring it here today to demonstrate also why as graduate students we refer to it as a preponderance of pages. So, but the moniker I think really g gave a lot of respect for what we thought Mel had accomplished. And in fact he now embarks upon a full scale study of the George W. Bush administration from which this talk tonight is derived. And I for one am proud to call him a colleague and a friend and also I will tell you that he's a real mensch. So if you'll join me on behalf of those who have been supporters of this university, our, our board, our, our uh, provost, uh, Paul Ludden, Dean Sutsui, who have all worked so hard to make the Center for Presidential History a reality, if you'll please join me in welcoming to the stage, or to the podium, Professor Melvin Leffler. Jeff, thanks for that uh, lovely introduction. I'd love to get into a page with the other four or five people who you think um, would be contending uh, for the um, title of best diplomatic historian um, so, uh, so that we could argue over the issues rather than really uh, contest over who's better than someone else. Actually, I'm glad that, that Jeff um, raised the book Preponderance of Power and mentioned that uh, it was based on a huge amount of archival evidence uh, because when I started thinking about perhaps writing a book about the George W. Bush administration, uh, one, of the, one of the things that attracted me was the fact that, okay, this time I'm not going to have that much archival evidence available to me um, because so much of it will be classified, but that I will have the opportunity uh, to interview lots of members of the administration and that that would itself be intrinsically interesting and very illuminating. Well, have an interview, having interviewed quite a few members uh, of the administration, by no, by no means all, and having found those interviews extremely engaging, I nonetheless yearn to have the archival documents uh, because uh, one quickly comes to realize how irreplaceable those archival documents are in terms of really writing good history. So um, the center here and the library have a great role to play in the future because there are lots of historians like myself 
eager, extremely eager, yearning uh, to see the archival evidence on which to write real history. Absent that archival evidence, most, uh, most historians and most journalists, most scholars have been relying on memoirs and personal interviews to write the history of the George W. Bush administration. When I talk about memoirs, I'm not just talking about the memoirs that you're familiar with. Of course, President Bush wrote a memoir. You know that leading members of the administration, like Vice President Cheney wrote a memoir, Condoleezza Rice has written a memoir, Donald Rumsfeld has written a memoir. Those are all very important memoirs and very illuminating. But really what's astounding about the Bush administration is how many memoirs already have been written. I suspect the number of memoirs from the Bush administration already far exceed the number of memoirs of any other administration, arguably, in American history. So in addition to the famous ones that you're aware of, there are a bunch of memoirs written by President Bush's close political advisors and media and communications people like Karl Rove and Karen Hughes. There are many memoirs written by leading generals in the administration. So the outgoing chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, Hugh Shelton, has a memoir. The incoming chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in, 19, in 2001, Dick Myers, has a memoir. Tommy Franks has a memoir. In addition to that, many of the key intelligence people who worked in the CIA and some of the leading counter-terrorist experts, like Richard Clark, has a memoir. George Tenet, the director of the CIA, already has a memoir. In fact, one of the first uh, memoirs. Paul Pillar, one of the really important intelligence analysts in the CIA, has a memoir. Other leading members of the cabinet, like the Attorney General, Ashcroft, has a memoir the head of the Office of Legal Counsel, the most important office in the Attorney General's office. Um, Jack Goldsmith has a memoir. He is a key person in terms of reviewing and passing on the various um, decrees with regard to detention and interrogation techniques. So we have a vast, vast number of memoirs that really demand analysis. In addition to the memoirs, there are several volumes that are very important in which policymakers did not actually write the memoir, but talked to leading journalists who, in fact, used the interviews and sometimes some private journals to write a book. So I'm thinking of Ron Suskin's book on Paul O'Neill, the first secretary of the tre Treasury, or Karen DeFrank's book. Uh, she's a journalist for the Washington Post. Uh, she wrote an extremely important book on co co uh, about Colin Powell based on these, on these interviews. Now, in general, I would say that these, these interviews are really extremely revealing, yet, of course, as you would expect from memoirs, also very self-serving. The, the memoirs leave much unsaid, and the memoirs distort and accentuate, yet they also illuminate a huge amount about personal relationships, about emotional sensibilities, and about key decisions and key decision points. These memoirs 
and the interviews that I'm alluding to that have gone on between leading policymakers and journalists, these memoirs and interviews already have generated a very, very large secondary literature. By that I mean to say books written by journalists and now increasingly by some historians and indeed some scholars. Much of this literature, in fact I would say the vast bulk of this literature that exists is extremely partisan, extremely partisan. And much of it, much of it, I would say unequivocally, the majority of this literature is also highly critical of the Bush administration. My own opinion is that we need better books and better scholarship on the George W. Bush administration. We need better books and better scholarship because as you all know, this was an absolutely critical time in the history of our country. It was a time when the United States was attacked. It was a time when American security was unequivocally impaired. In some ways, as a person who spent 15 years writing about the origins of the Cold War, I would say that 2001, 2002 is a period even more foreboding and in some ways more important than the early Cold War. So faced with new threats in 2001 after 9-11 and with the prospective proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, we, the educated citizenry, we want to know whether the George W. Bush administration conceived a strategy that kept Americans safe and the United States secure, as almost all the top administration officials insist in their memoirs. We want to know, I'm sure you want to know, if President Bush and his top advisors produced a freedom agenda that spawned the hopes now undergirding the Arab Spring. Some of George Bush's top advisors, like Paul Wolfowitz, hark back to 2002 and 2003 and 2004 and claim that the policies of the Bush administration have resonated deeply over time and are critically important in understanding contemporary developments in the Middle East. Alternatively, alternatively, we want to know whether the policies of the Bush administration enveloped the United States, as many critics say, in an unnecessary war in Iraq and a protracted experiment in half-hearted and ultimately ineffective nation building in Afghanistan. Did Bush and his advisors embrace a proactive strategy of preemption and unilateralism that produced more enemies and fewer friends? That's what the critics say. And the memoirs actually in their totality represent conflicting views about this. There are many critical views written from people who were inside the Bush administration, as well as many positive views. They are by no means uniformly favorable, as one might think. The memoirs, pro and con, favorable and unfavorable, don't settle the basic questions that I don't outline. Nor do the competing secondary accounts that have proliferated over the last five or eight years settle these very basic questions about how to assess the Bush administration. And I hope I won't disappoint you to say, if I say that I'm not going to resolve these issues myself today. That's not what I am capable of doing at this point in time. Nor is it my task today <laughs> 
to single out particular memoirs and to assess whether a particular memoir is better than other memoirs. That's not what I want to do. Instead, I want to take this time that I have to assess how the memoirs in their collectivity confirm or disconfirm or complicate what most of us think we know about the Bush administration and its embrace of a global war on terror, its immersion in Afghanistan and in Iraq. Now, I dwell on these matters, the global war on terror, the intervention in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq. I dwell on these issues because these are the issues that consume the vast bulk of attention of the memoirists of the Bush administration. There were other things that one could claim were important, but these issues consume the bulk of the attention of almost every single memoir of the Bush administration. I want to reflect in conclusion, after I illuminate what memoirs confirm or disconfirm, I want to reflect in my conclusion on the very issues, the most important issues that I think still merit a great deal of clarification. So let me begin substantively by asking the question, what do the memoirs seem to agree on? What do they confirm that most observers think they know about the Bush administration? Actually, the memoirs agree on numerous fundamental issues, and they actually confirm many of the things that we popularly think are true and that he have emerged in many of the journalistic accounts and that actually are frequently, but not always, critical of the Bush administration. Before 9-11, almost all the memoirs point out, and this is pretty interesting, um, domestic priorities, not foreign policy concerns, but domestic priorities trumped foreign policy goals. Initially, President Bush was not primarily concerned with foreign policy. He was concerned primarily with tax cuts and with education reform. Secondly, the memoirs pretty much confirm that despite warnings, sometimes very shrill warnings, Terrorism never became a top concern of the leading people in the Bush administration prior to 9-11. The memoirs also confirm something that we all know. 9-11 transformed the preoccupations and priorities of President Bush and his closest advisors. 9-11 shocked. 9-11 traumatized. 9-11 also empowered Bush's advisors. 9-11 infused President Bush and his closest advisors with a sense of mission that they had not heretofore possessed. It infused a sense of purposefulness that previously they had not demonstrated and that they had often commented upon amongst themselves. What are we basically trying to do in terms of foreign policy? There was much ambiguity. 9-11 changed all of that. And the memoirs agree that the American goal after 9-11 was to disrupt a global terrorist network. In other words, Afghanistan from the very beginning was conceived as just a first step by almost all of Bush's advisors. And President Bush himself writes in his memoir, quote, we would fight the war on terror 
on the offensive, and the first battlefront would be Afghanistan. The memoirs also suggest that the policies of detention, rendition, and in so-called enhanced interrogation, what many of President Bush's critics call torture, that those policies were conceived in these very first months after 9-11, in these very, very first months after 9-11. And many policymakers in the Bush administration actually acknowledge openly that they made the decision to engage in such practices. It might surprise you that President Bush himself writes the following in his memoir. Quote, had we not authorized waterboarding, in other words, he acknowledges that he authorized waterboarding, had we not authorized waterboarding on senior Al-Qaeda leaders, I would have had to accept a greater risk that the country would be attacked. In the wake of 9-11, that was a risk I was unwilling to take. Now, after the dislodgement of the Taliban, after the dispersal of the Taliban, the memoirs also confirm, as many accounts have it, that there was very, very little desire for nation building inside Afghanistan. Almost immediately, attention gravitated to Iraq. The memoirs, the memoir, the memoirists agree, unhappily they agree, that they possessed very faulty intelligence about Iraqi weapons of mass destruction. Almost all the memoirists concede, moreover, that they exaggerated what they did know. Most of them acknowledge that they usually inflated the threat. The memoirs also demonstrate something else very important about the Bush administration that I think most of us know. The memoirs demonstrate that there were heated, incredibly heated disputes within the administration over whether Saddam and Iraq was contained or not contained. Whether Saddam had links to Al-Qaeda or had no links. And if he had links, as some thought he did, there was a great deal of contestation over how portentous or how ominous these links actually were. So there was really intense disputes, I would say, rancor, that almost all the memoirists acknowledge. There was feuding, in other words, and hostility within the administration. Feuding and hostility that, unfortunately, the memoirists agree, interfered with effective policy making. For example, there never was a meeting, not one, in which the fundamental question of the benefits and risks of going to war in Iraq was discussed. George Tenet, in his memoir with regard to this issue, says, and I'm quoting, quote, there was never a serious debate within the administration about the imminence of the Iraqi threat. Actually, what's interesting is that in his own memoir, President Bush acknowledges that he never convened a specific meeting to discuss the pros and cons of going to war in Iraq. And he says he didn't do this 
he says, because he knew what his advisors thought about this issue and that there was no reason to have a systematic discussion, that the only advisor whom he thought had qualms, high advisor whom he thought had qualms about going to war was Secretary of State Powell. And so he asked the Secretary of State to speak to him individually and to articulate openly whether or not he was willing to support going to war. And President Bush confirms that Secretary of State Powell at this meeting, one-on-one -on -one with the President said, yes, if you, want, if you want to go to war, I will support it. And actually that's confirmed in the biography by Karen DeFrank of Secretary Powell. All of it which illuminates, however, that there was never a meeting in which all these people came together to discuss whether or not it made sense to go to war. Now the memoirists also agree, also agree, that there was especially flawed planning regarding the so-called phase four of the war in Iraq. Phase four referred to the period that would occur after overt hostilities ended. The post-war period, the reconstruction period, all the memoirs agree that insufficient attention was given to the problems that ultimately emerged. Planning, most of them acknowledge, not all, but most acknowledge, planning for the post-war period was poor, was superficial, was ineffective. Defense officials like Secretary Rumsfeld and Under Secretary of State Douglas, uh, Under Secretary of Defense Douglas Fife, who's written an extremely good memoir, very weighty memoir, both of these defense officials blame the poor decision making with regard to planning for post-war reconstruction. Both of them blame it on the National Security Advisor, Condoleezza Rice. So Donald Rumsfeld, for example, writes in his memoir, quote, fundamental differences remained unaddressed and unresolved by the president because he says that Rice didn't bring these issues to the president's attention, didn't make it clear to the president how much contestation existed over post-war planning. Douglas Fife writes in his memoir, and I'm quoting, Rice's pursuit of harmony came at the expense of coherence, end quote. So the memoirs actually agree on the rancor and how the rancor actually affected some critical decisions with regard to the post-war situation in Iraq. Finally, the memoirs confirm the hubris and the self-confidence that top officials possessed, especially after they experienced quick success in Afghanistan, much quicker than they actually had anticipated. The advisors around President Bush assumed, and so did he, that American power would prevail and that American values would be embraced. Richard Haas, the director of the policy planning staff in the State Department, who met with the president on a couple of critical occasions in the run-up to the war in Iraq, writes that he was astounded by President Bush's self-confidence. And he says, quote, it was real confidence, not bluster, end quote. And National Security Advisor Rice concedes that in her memoir, that the confidence actually 
bordered on hubris. That's what she says. When Saddam actually was driven from power and his statue came down inside Baghdad. So in these multiple ways, the memoirs of many of the high-ranking officials confirm a lot of things that have appeared in journalistic accounts and that many people who have thought about and read about the Bush administration think about it. The memoirs actually confirm many important things. But equally important, very important, the memoirs rebut many established wisdoms. First of all, the memoirs repudiate the notion that the war against Iraq was planned and conceived even prior to 9-11. That is a very popular notion that exists in a huge amount of the literature, that the war against Iraq was going to happen regardless of 9-11. And I think the memoirs actually make it very, very clear that this was not the case. 9-11 was decisive. Prior to 9-11, Condoleezza Rice writes, prior to 9-11, our focus was not on overthrowing Saddam Hussein. Dov Zakheim, who was the controller in the Pentagon and who was on the team of advisors that gathered around Condoleezza Rice during the election campaign of 2000, prior to President Bush's election, he writes, Dov Zakheim writes, that the advisors to President Bush, the foreign policy advisors to President Bush, quote, never debated, end quote, the idea of going to war against Iraq. And Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld writes in his memoir that President Bush never talked to him about going to war in Iraq when he selected him as Secretary of Defense, and that, in effect, during the months from January 2001 until September 2001, Donald Rumsfeld writes, our policy with regard to Iraq was, quote, end quote, adrift. Nothing had been decided, and war certainly was not contemplated. The memoirs also make clear that after 9-11, the proponents of coercive diplomacy, the proponents of coercive diplomacy and military action, People like Vice President Cheney and his advisor Scooter Libby and Paul Wolfowitz and Douglas Fife, that these people, these proponents of military action, the memoirs make clear, were not primarily seeking to inflict revenge on the alleged perpetrators of 9-11. That's not why they wanted to go to war. The memoirs also make clear that the advocates of war, like Shaney and Wolfowitz, that the advocates of war were not motivated by a desire to promote democracy in Iraq or the greater Middle East, nor were they motivated by, the, by a desire to garner control over Persian Gulf oil, as so many accounts claim and as so many of the people, so many people in the world believe. The memoirs suggest something pretty pedestrian. The memoirs suggest what you might think, that the administration went to war because officials feared another attack, because they saw Saddam Hussein as a looming threat. The proponents of war make it clear in their memoirs that they wanted to warn other rogue regimes what might await them if they coddled terrorists 
or if they, pro or if they continued programs of weapons of mass destruction. More than anything else, I think, the memoirs rebut popular notions that hubris and revenge inspired the war in Iraq. Now, I want to emphasize that the memoirs, the memoirs do not show that hubris and revenge were not present, as I just indicated. Hubris and revenge were present to some extent. But nonetheless, what the memoirs do make clear is that other factors were of far greater importance in shaping the administration's mentalité. What was most important? The memoirs make clear that the following were most important. Fear, anxiety, responsibility, and guilt. The memoirs illustrate how the onset of planning occurred in an atmosphere of frightful anxiety. George Tenet, in his memoir, estimates that there were about 400 specific threats each month from September 2001 to the middle of 2003. The memoirs make clear that a preoccupation with the possibility of an anthrax attack and bioterrorism was of critical importance in heightening the sense of anxiety and fear. The memoirs make clear that the discovery in Afghanistan after the Taliban fled, that Al-Qaeda was indeed seeking weapons of mass destruction caused even greater anxiety and consternation. President Bush in his memoirs says that right after 9-11, he unequivocally predicted that the United States would be attacked again in the next few days. CIA director George Tenet writes in his memoir, it was inconceivable to us, I'm quoting, that bin Laden had not already positioned people to conduct second and possibly third and fourth waves of attack inside the United States, end quote. Condi Rice writes in her memoir that the pressures were, quote, end quote, unspeakable. General Myers, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, says operating in the weeks after 9-11 was a nightmare, quote, end quote. Jack Goldsmith, who headed the Office of Legal Counsel, said that the administration lived in, quote, end quote, unremitting fear, fear. Now, along with the fear and anxiety, the memoirs illuminate an enormous sense of responsibility. President Bush and his top advisors wanted to do what you would expect them to do and what you would hope they would do. They felt a huge responsibility to protect the American people, to secure the nation. Motivations that often go pretty much undiscussed in many of the secondary journalistic accounts. A true sense of responsibility. But the memoirs also highlight that along with this sense of responsibility, there were feelings of guilt. Guilt that these people had been on watch on the day 9-11 occurred. They had failed to prevent 9-11, and they felt apprehension about how the American people would react if another such t attack occurred. So Condi Rice writes in her memoir, revealingly, I think, I could not have forgiven myself had there been another attack. 
And had that happened, there would have been a different type of second guessing as Americans asked, why did you not do everything to keep it from happening again, end quote. And President Bush writes in his memoir that he knew the public reactions would be, and I'm quoting, colored by whether we were tacked again. People would demand to know why I had not done more, end quote. The memoirs also rebut allegations that administration officials lied purposefully when they said that they believed that Saddam had weapons of mass destruction. All the memoirs confirm that virtually everyone in the administration sincerely believed, sincerely believed that Saddam possessed or would quickly develop weapons of mass destruction, especially chemical and biological weapons. They were wrong, but they sincerely believed it, which is not then to say that they were disingenuous, as many critics argue. Lastly, I think the memoirs very much rebut the popular notion that President Bush was a weak president, that he was Vice President Cheney's pawn. Actually, almost all the memoirs, even the ones that are critical, show that President Bush was the key decision maker and that he was focused, resolute, and decisive so in all those ways, the memoirs, I think, sort of rebut many popular notions that exist about the nature of the, of the administration. But the memoirs also highlight areas of ambiguity. They raise very important questions that beg for clarification. And here are some of the most important. Why was there not more focus why was there not more focus on a prospective terrorist attack prior to 9-11? George Tenet, the head of the CIA, Dick Clark, who was the head of counterterrorism inside the White House, Paul Pilar, who was one of the leading intelligence analysts, in their memoirs, they offer incredibly convincing evidence that they warned top policymakers of a prospective attack, yet not much was done. Why? Second key question that needs clarification. Why did, a, why did attention gravitate so quickly to Iraq rather than other places like Iran or North Korea or Syria or Libya? Why did attention gravitate so quickly to Iraq? And much more fundamentally, was Iraq actually contained prior to 9-11, so there shouldn't have been reason to worry about it, or was it not contained? There was a heated debate in the administration about whether Iraq was contained or was not contained, whether you really needed to do things. And there, is still ambiguity. Was Iraq contained so that no action was really necessary? Or was action really imperative as Vice President Cheney and Scooter Libby and Paul Wolfowitz particularly argued? Another key question, what was coercive diplomacy designed to do? Almost all the members of the administration, when they talk about the military preparations for war during the year 2002, the run-up to the war, almost all of them highlight the fact that they thought they were engaging in what they called coercive diplomacy. Condi Rice writes in her memoir that in January 2002, she explained the term to coercive diplomacy to President Bush. He had been unaware of the term. He said he loved that notion. That was exactly what he was trying to do, to build up American military capabilities, deploy them to the region with the intent of engaging in coercive diplomacy. Well, was that in fact the case? Were there real efforts 
to try to understand what the diplomacy sought to achieve, what the coercion sought to achieve, or were policymakers simply deceiving themselves and actually simply preparing to take military action and not actually engage in any diplomacy? Those are issues that still remain ambiguous. Then there's the question of, did torture work? I think it's pretty obvious why torture was approved. But it's not at all evident if the proponents of torture ever asked whether torture had worked in the past. We should want to know whether they asked this question, and we should want to know whether, in fact, torture did or did not work. This is an issue clearly raised in the new film that, about the hunt for bin Laden that has aroused so much controversy. Then we need to know, why was there such problematic, why was there so many problems that afflicted the decision-making process. Why was there no meeting? Why was there no meeting to discuss the pros and cons of going to war? Why so little focus on phase four, the post-war period? Why so much bickering and feuding? And most of all, most of all, why did President Bush allow the bickering and feuding to fester as it did. Why was there so much chaos in the decision making at the outset of the occupation period? Why did President Bush choose Paul Premer to run the occupation? Why were there such confused lines of communication between Washington and Baghdad once Bremer went to Baghdad? Why, most of all, did President Bush allow Paul Bremer to reverse many of the key ideas that he and his advisors already had agreed upon with regard to the occupation? It's clear that Paul Bremer did reverse many of the most important ideas about debathification, the disbandment of the army, and a recognition of an Iraqi interim authority. He changed most of the prevailing notions that were supposed to shape the occupation period, and President Bush allowed this to happen, and we really don't understand why that was the case. And then finally, as I'm sure many of you who lived through this period want to know, why was it so difficult for American military forces who won a quick and precipitous victory, why did they have so much difficulty immediately in April and May and June of 2003, establishing order and security. Why did this happen at the very outset of the, of the occupation period? Because almost all commentators believe that it was the chaos and insecurity during these first months of the occupation that tremendously alienated Iraqis and that fed into the insurrection that would eventually become so devastating. So in conclusion, I want to emphasize that the memoirs tell us a whole lot, a whole lot that's important. What I think is most revealing about the memoirs is how vividly they illuminate the importance of fear, uncertainty, vulnerability, guilt, and responsibility in the making of policy. And this is so clearly illuminated at the very outset of Condoleezza Rice's memoir. Pick up her memoir. It's a very good memoir. And you'll see, interestingly, that prominently, at the very end of her very short preface, she narrates the following story. She writes, that as she completed her term as Secretary of State, she visited New Delhi. She walked into the Indian Prime Minister's living room and, she writes, came to face to face with his national security advisor. 
M.K. Narayanan. Condoleezza writes, Condoleezza Rice writes, reminds us, that India had recently experienced the horrendous terrorist attack in Mumbai. And Narayan, Rice writes, quote, had the same shell-shocked look that I remembered seeing in the mirror after the attacks on the Twin Towers and the Pentagon. She continues, I took his hands and I said, quote, it's not your fault. I know how you feel. It's like being in a dark room with doors all around and knowing anything might pop out again and again and attack. But now, Rice told him, now, quote, you have to concentrate on preventing the next attack. Rice then says that she could not recall how Narayanan responded. But she says, it didn't matter. Quote, I was very much inside myself. I was replaying those awful days in the wake of 9-11 that had from, time, from that time forward been September 12th over and over and over again. Nothing was ever the same. Protest as you might to yourself. Protest as you might to the nation or to the world, you never get over that feeling you could have done better. And you resolve never, ever to let it happen again." End quote. Such a quotation placed prominently at the end of the preface evocatively and vividly illustrates how pervasive was the sense of shock and fear and guilt and responsibility. The memoirs by Bush and Rice and Cheney and Rumsfeld and Fife invite sympathy. They invite empathy. But they also leave a view of a contentious, bifurcated administration an administration trying to do good, trying to provide security, yet rife with acrimony and distrust. President Bush, in my opinion, surprisingly emerges as an enigmatic figure in these memoirs. Yes, he was a man with strong convictions, with great inner strength. He was emotional, yet resolute. He was incurious about many things, but nonetheless, very focused. His beliefs are clear. His likes and dislikes are transparent in the memoirs. Yet I suggest that he remains ultimately enigmatic to historians and scholars because his perceptions and thinking remain blurry regarding many of the key decisions. How did he assess the competing priorities and trade-offs? We don't really know. Overall, I would say that we scholars who are working on the Bush administration need to stop criticizing we also need to stop praising, and we need to start to seek to understand, because key matters, extraordinarily important issues are at stake. How should the United States government operate in a globalized world characterized by the instantaneous flow of information, the easy movement of people? and the prevalence of non-state actors infused with radical beliefs and empowered by the prospect of securing weapons of mass destruction? That's a really important question. How much commitment, 
should, be, should the United States focus on nation building? How much effort should go into a so-called freedom agenda? And what should such an agenda look like? Another key question, when should the United States embrace counterinsurgency? And when should it embrace counterterrorism? Is torture acceptable? Under what conditions? Is preemption acceptable? When? Now these are very tough questions. We can learn key lessons about these questions, about these issues, if we seriously engage the decision-making process within the Bush administration without partisan rancor and without dutiful loyalty. We can learn lessons if we blend empathy and criticism, if we grasp competing priorities, if we understand the constraints and the limited choices, and if we appreciate the environment of fear and revenge, of hubris and vulnerability in which officials operated. To do what we need to do as scholars and historians and as concerned citizens, we must await the opening of the Bush Papers. As a long-term scholar of the history of American foreign policy, I can say that many of us are extremely eager to paint an accurate portrait of the administration, to correct distortions, and to illuminate a recent past that was filled with trauma and emotion, and of which we still know far too little, despite all these memoirs. So SMU and the George W. Bush Library and this center have an extremely important role to play. They can do a service to the country if they proceed quickly to open the papers and nurture a civil discourse over vitally important questions. Thank you. Sure. After 9-11, there was so much global sympathy for the United States. Was there any discussion of why a coalition uh, wasn't developed with other countries to, to, instead of going it alone, try to work harder diplomatically to bring in the, the other uh, allied powers? Well, I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a broad way, people in the administration talked about having allies. If you read the memoirs, they're almost all defensive about, almost all the higher members of the administration are defensive about this very issue. That is to say that we really would have liked to have had more allies. But they really, in actuality, did not work very hard, even with regard to Afghanistan. And to be, to be brief, I think the key reason for that is defense officials in particular felt that working with allies would simply complicate the effort. They felt that they needed to take action right away, and that was difficult enough. And trying to coordinate this with a group of allies would make it almost impractical. Now, of course, what the administration did immediately, Donald Rumsfeld almost immediately went to Central Asia to try to get allies there so that we could, you know, so we could station troops and have bases and use, uh, get overflight rights and things of that sort. And of course, Under Secretary of State Dick Armitage immediately went to Pakistan to try to get Pakistani cooperation in the struggle against Afghanistan. In those ways, there was sort of a reach out, particularly to the countries which American officials saw as vitally important to the types of things that the United States itself thought it needed to do. But 
not a desire to complicate war making in this dire emergency by getting involved with the French or the British or, um, or, or the Germans. Um, now, the British did help, but there was nonetheless, especially in Iraq, but nonetheless there was a sense that this was, that working with allies would be a complicating factor. And then, of course, when it came to going to war in Iraq, they were un, more or less un, unable and unwilling to do so because basically most of the, many of the allies were fundamentally opposed to going to war in Iraq. So, you know, they might have liked more help there, but they were unable to muster that. Sure. Do the memoirs cast a much light on the inner tensions within the Bush family? That is, the former Bush's foreign policy advisors' disagreements with the advisors to the younger Bush? Uh, Sorry, it's out of batteries. Oh, okay, fine. <laughs> I have a feeling you don't like what I'm saying. Um, so that 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 is um, a, ter a terrific question, and the the answer to the answer to that is there is not much attention on that issue in the memoirs. There is a little attention focused on it because Brent Scowcroft in particular wrote an editorial and, and some of the memoirs you know, wrote an editorial saying that the administration should go slowly, that it didn't look like a wise idea to go to war in Iraq. Brent Scowcroft wrote that. And at the time, in August of 2002, that letter, which I think appeared in the Wall Street Journal, um, that letter evoked a lot of, of public attention. And some of the memoirs talk about that letter, and Condi Rice makes clear that she spoke to Brent Scowcroft and communicated to him just how angry she was about that letter. Um, and alternatively, it's clear that Secretary of State Powell spoke to Brent Scowcroft, and it's clear in the biography that he talked to Karen DeFrank when she wrote, that he spoke to Brent Scowcroft and said to Brent Scowcroft, thanks a lot, you're making my job easier. And uh, you've opened up an opportunity for me. But there's no, you know, real, really illuminated discussion of what they thought about it and whether it provoked any fundamental rethinking. That's what's absent. That's what one would love to know. What did George W. Bush think about that? He knew Brent Scowcroft, you know, was his father's key advisor, obviously. Um, what did he really think about that? If I recall, President Bush 43 makes a quick allusion, but doesn't talk about it in any way whatsoever. And more fundamentally, there's not much illumination of what the younger Bush and the older Bush really were saying to one another. George W. Bush suggests in his memoir that there was a purposeful effort of the two men, father and son, not to discuss these issues. Now, should we believe that? <coughs> I really don't know. I would invite your comments. I don't know. Some of you here may know them far better than I do. So, yes, sure. Sure. Thank you very much, first of all, for your presentation. It seems like you've raised a, a methodological question for diplomatic historians. You're describing almost what we might call the fog of decision making in the executive branch, as opposed to the fog of war, because what questions are you really trying to answer? Are you trying to answer what was in George Bush's head, which is unknowable and impossible, to, or are you trying to decide what are the questions that the entire administration that he led had to make? And do they ever join, do administrations, forget about, you know, think of Kennedy and the, and the Cuban Missile Crisis maybe as the archetype of the, the time when you're most focused for a relatively short period of time. And even then, there were questions that come out later on that we didn't know what was. So you're trying to decide and answer so many <coughs> questions, it seems, about, I, I, I was there at a lot of those meetings. Mm -hmm. um, I have slightly different views, but I think you're being fair overall about what people are saying, but I'm not sure there's one answer. In other words, so what are you trying to, what is a diplomatic historian trying to tell us, you know, for generations? What level of analysis do you try to answer? Well, well I, I, I think, um, as I've 
try to do in, in my other books, what, what I think is imperative, is if there are multiple stories, and there must be, that you try to illuminate the multiple stories, the conflicting advice, um, but then ultimately, if it is the president on some issues, and frankly, it's not always the president making the key decisions, uh, but if it is the president, ultimately what the historian wants to do is, how, is to illuminate how the key decision maker processes, processes the conflicting advice and how he resolves. Very tough questions. What I, my presentation is a invocation of empathy because it is not easy. I've studied other policymakers. You've been there. You know how, you know far better probably how tough it is. But the, the, the historian's mission is to illuminate the conflicting imperatives and try to illuminate as well how the conflicting imperatives are resolved. What's disappointing, in my judgment, about the memoirs is that we don't really get a feel of those processes. Now, when you read the memoirs of some other administrations or policymakers, when you read Dean Acheson's memoir or George Schultz's memoir, you actually get a somewhat better feeling for that. And so I think a historian like myself ultimately would like to engage exactly in what you're saying. My, to the extent that I'm criticizing the memoirs, what's disappointing to me as a scholar is they don't, they don't help me a whole lot in addressing some of the most fundamental issues that I would love to address. Yeah, sure. Um, I, you almost started to answer the question that I was going to ask, which is, uh, are you ready to start making any comparisons with other presidents and their decision-making styles, George W. versus Harry Truman, for example? Can, can you begin to generalize at all? Um, that, 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 that is uh, wonderful. Okay, is everybody ready for a couple of hours? I mean, uh, so, uh, and... Uh, Okay, so l let me, let me um, as a reference point, allude to total opposites. Dwight Eisenhower, who ran a decision-making process that was extraordinarily systematic. Now, that has a lot to do with his military background, um, but one of the really amazing things one of the really amazing things is to read the National Security Council transcripts of meetings of Dwight Eisenhower and his advisors, where things were laid out incredibly systematically, options were laid out, there were real discussions, and most of all, President Eisenhower talks and talks and comments and is incisive and raises questions I think that is really the extraordinary aspect. Now, not many presidents, even if they structure a good decision-making process, actually talk a whole lot during the structured process. So Harry Truman had a reasonably, for, for the early post-war years when the national security the national security decision-making structures were just emerging, he did, I would say, a reasonably decent job in convening his advisors together. He almost never said anything at these meetings, very, very rarely, and he almost always accepted the advice of Dean Acheson. As Dean Acheson writes in his memoir, and I think many, many scholarly books have demonstrated, um, Dean Acheson writes, as long as I kept the president informed, as long as I explained to him exactly why I was doing the things I intended to do, he would always be supportive. Nonetheless, let me point out that the Truman administration in 1949 and 1950 
um, when the Soviets developed their own atomic bomb, uh, when there was the, the scandal with Alger Hiss, uh, when the Korean War was about to break out, and when the administration was deliberating on the famous National Security Council Paper 68, the administration was infused with rancor because the Secretary of Defense at the time, Lewis Johnson, despised what was being proposed. And so there was an extraordinary amount of acrimony in that administration as well. So how a president resolves this acrimony is a really, really difficult process and how you do it. President Truman resolved it by firing Johnson and getting a new Secretary of Defense. Uh, and, and, and seriously, it opens up the question that many writers have presented about the administration of George W. Bush about whether one of the things he should have done was to get rid of Secretary of Defense Rumsfeld much earlier or whether he could have done something. What perplexes me, the scholar, perhaps more than anything else, is why the president allowed all this infighting to persist. Uh, fighting that clearly was interfering with good decision making. I have no idea what the answer is. Maybe you, you'll be able to answer that. Yes. I, I was just going to ask this one question, and this is really kind of an opinion on your part. If there's so much agreement in the um, scholarly work that you're talking about, about why we went to war, about the fact that he was not trying to go to war, that there was, um, you know, reasons why we went into Iraq, good or bad, why is it, in your opinion, does it seem like the American people keep hanging on to the idea that this is what he wanted from the beginning. He was looking for a reason to, you know, justify his father, those kinds of things. Like I said, this is an opinion, so. Right. Well, I really should do something very nasty and ask my friend Jeff Engel to answer that question. But, uh, uh, but, <laughs> but, but I think your question is a very good one. There is, if I gave this talk, to a group of my friends, all of whom were scholars. They would pick on this same point, and they would say, Leffler, you're out of your mind. They wanted to go to war from day one. And I think that is profoundly wrong. They may have wanted regime change from day one. I think they did, but so did Bill Clinton. Um, but it's a very different thing to say that they wanted war. And I think both the memoirs in their totality make it clear that no one was really preparing for war prior to 9-11. And I say that because the military people show no evidence that they had been asked in any serious a way to prepare for war. Now, they were preoccupied with the fact that the Iraqis were interfering with the no-flight zones in the south and the north, but planning, that's a totally different thing than planning for war. So the answer to your question, why, why do so many people believe it? Because I think it's a simple answer, it's a shortcut to serious thinking, and it's a way of avoiding all the really tough issues that policymakers actually face and that good scholars must address. Well, before we get to um, thanking Professor Leffler, uh, I'm, re I'm struck, as you mentioned, the dynamic between President Truman and Dean Atchison, that Truman relied so heavily on Atchison, and the two actually develop a close relationship. But as you were talking, I was also reminded of a quote that Atchison made describing Truman, whom he liked very much, but who also, Atchison did say of Truman, that he was like a little boy that you find sticking peanuts up his nose and when you tell him to stop and turn around, you find he's again sticking peanuts up his nose. Uh, 
I don't quite know what that means. But I'm sure it's not necessarily complimentary. I think that's an anecdote that's very appealing and it's wonderful to, but that uh, I don't think it in any way really reflects what Dean Acheson thought about Harry Truman. I really don't. Well. I am, I am but so, it's wonderful for your lectures yes, thank you. in class. Yes. I am so glad we haven't given you your honorarium yet. But nonetheless, uh, three points, uh, if I may. Uh, the first is that we have refreshments outside, and I hope you all join us in uh, having those and continue the discussion. Uh, secondly, please, if, as you walk outside, grab one of our flyers to see what our future events are going to be. And third, uh, please take time as you stop outside to uh, visit with Professor Leffler and purchase one of his books. So if you would, please join me in thanking Melvin Leffler.